Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for today's message comes from the gospel reading that you heard a few moments ago from Mark chapter 8. I share with you these words. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as you hear the gospel reading today, you can't help but feel a little bit sorry for, for poor Peter uh, in the middle of all of this. He is the leader of the apostles that are traveling with Jesus. And he's always the one who seems to be the, the first one to speak out or speak on behalf of those apostles. But that doesn't mean that he's the only one who's thinking certain thoughts. No doubt the rest of them are also probably in agreement with, with Peter as he shares these things. But put yourself in, in their place for just a moment. They've been moving around somewhat. It says now they're in the area of Caesarea Philippi, going to be visiting the, the villages there. And Jesus is, in a sense, taking a, a pulse read, if you will, from the disciples, beginning a conversation. What are you hearing from folks? What, what are they saying about me? And he gets the various answers that they give. You know, some say that you're John the Baptist, some Elijah. Some say you're one of the other a prophet, well, one of the other prophets. In any sense, it seems that, that people are, are pretty convinced he's a prophet. Jesus must be a prophet of some kind. They don't know exactly what, but he must be a prophet. But then the conversation goes on. And he says, but, but who do you say that I am? You know, you've been with me for a while now. You've seen the things that I've done, and you've heard what I've been teaching at, at different places. Who do you say that I am? And Peter very boldly confesses Christ. You are the Christ. Or in other versions of, of this and in the other Gospels, it's recorded as, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. It is a very bold proclamation that, that Jesus made at this point. Peter was recognizing who Jesus is. And Jesus tells them it's not your own power that you've recognized this, but rather it's the work of the Holy Spirit that you are able to know who I am. Well, in the, the compact version that we have here from Mark, the conversation then goes on. Jesus explains exactly what it means that he is the Christ. What's going to happen? Well, he's going to be handed over to the Jewish authorities. And he is going to suffer and die. And on the third day, he's going to rise again. And you can see... Peter and maybe the other disciples scratching their head and, and trying to digest what this is that Jesus is telling them. And then it says, Peter took Jesus aside. You can see him sort of putting his arm around him and, and stepping aside for just a second. But the other disciples are watching and, and hearing what is said. And Peter says something to the effect of, no way, Lord, this, this is not a good thing. Plan. That's not the way it's going to be. The idea that, that somehow the, the Christ of God is going to come into the world, and Peter, no doubt, is still thinking he's going to establish an earthly kingdom. How can you do that if you get killed? That is not a good plan. And says Jesus looked around for a second and saw the other disciples, and then in their sight said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Wow. You can see Peter way up here. You know, you are the Christ. And then way down there, get behind me, Satan. How difficult that had to be for, for him to, to deal with at that point. But what was going on? 
They recognized who Jesus was. But Jesus' plan was the problem. It was their plan, Peter's plan, that, that he had in mind. Let's go to Jerusalem, maybe, and let's get you on that throne of David. And let's drive the Romans out as you establish the kingdom that God has long promised. That's the plan. We'll get an army together. That's a good plan. You're setting your, your mind on the things of man, not the things of God. Does that happen in our world today? Do we sometimes set our mind on our own plans? We, we don't really think about, about what, what God has in mind? One of my, my pet things that I've picked up on recently and is, is not to knock you all, but, but we say it. When we, we think about, you know, how are you today? What's well, a very common response to that? It's better than the alternative. Well, what's the alternative? Well, you're talking about it's, uh, it's better to be alive than to be dead. Well, what happens if you die as a Christian? You go to be with the Lord. Instead, you're here. What's going on here? Well, good things right here. But, but the world, we just sat in Bible class and complained about the things that are going on in the world. There's a lot of good things that happen, but there's a lot of nuts things that happen in the world too, and bad things that happen where human reason takes over. And we can decide what gender we are now. We can marry pretty much anyone we want to marry now because we know what's best. We don't have to follow God's word. That's something, you know, from a long time ago. We set our minds on the things of man and not on the things of God. And we have our own plans and we, we want to work all of those things out. Now we look at the world and we say the world is nuts, but even us here in the church, just like Peter and the disciples, we sometimes set our minds on the things of man. For a Christian, it's not uncommon, a Lutheran Christian, it's not uncommon that we, we go through catechism, we grow up and, and we hear how many times that we are saved by grace through faith, which we know only through the scriptures as the Holy Spirit works through that. And yet, Sometimes we end up beginning to think that because we have lived a good life, that's why God's going to let us into heaven. I haven't done some of the things that others did. I was in church every Sunday or almost every Sunday. I went to Bible class. I took the sacrament as it was offered. That's why God's going to let me into heaven. And we begin to lose sight at times that I am a poor, miserable sinner. Even sitting here in these pews, even as a pastor, a poor, miserable sinner, separated from God by my sins, and only being saved by the grace of God through the faith that God has given me to, to believe that Jesus has paid for my sins. And through that, heaven is now opened to even me, a sinner. Peter had lost sight of that. And no doubt the other disciples were losing sight of that as well. God's ways are not our ways. In the scriptures it says, my ways are not your ways, or your ways are not my ways. You know, think of it either way. The way we think and understand things are not necessarily the way that God is going to work. And Peter had a lesson in that that day. Peter's plan was the way the world normally works. Let's get you on the throne. Let's get an army together. Let's conquer the world, if you will. But that wasn't God's plan. God's plan looked pretty weak and senseless as far as Peter would be concerned. 
The idea that you're going to go and be handed over to the authorities and, and you're going to be crucified and, and die and, and rise again. Well, that's pretty hopeful thinking, don't you think? His way of looking at things was limited as ours is. Go back to the Old Testament reading for just a moment. Did you catch that as it started out today? When, when Abraham was 99 years old, God came to him and made this promise about a child. That's not the way the world normally works with 99-year-olds. But then he's very clear that it's going to be through Sarah. Not through someone else, not through Hagar or anyone else. It was through Sarah that Abraham was going to have a child. Why did God do that so late in their life? Why didn't they have this child earlier? God's ways are not our ways. And Abraham and Sarah had a lesson in that. God was going to show it was, it was him who was at work and not the, the normal means of, of how a child would come into being in this world. Not exactly the, the normal way when you're that age. But nonetheless, God could do it. Just as God can send a Savior into the world. His own Son, the second person of the Holy Trinity from eternity, who takes on human flesh and is born of the Virgin Mary, can live a life under the law on our behalf, and yes, can even be handed over to the authorities, can suffer and die, and just as he promised, rise again from the dead, that our sins would be paid for, and that heaven would be opened up to each of us, that we would have a sure and certain hope. God's ways, thanks be to God, are not our ways. Because he knows what he's doing, and he is firmly in control. This sinful generation. Let's see how they said it at the end of our reading today. I was thinking it, it sounded very much like, like our generation uh, as we are thinking about it. They called to him the, the crowd with his disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Sinful and adulterous generation. That's what Jesus spoke of in his time. The world has continued to decline. It has ups and downs, if you will, at various times. But in general, the trajectory is down into greater sinfulness. So if it was a, a, an adulterous and sinful generation back in, in Jesus' day, it is far more so today. And as you look at the world, you see that. Jesus was in control in his day, and he remains firmly in control in our day. Working through what appear to be weak means, the means of grace, through his word, through his sacrament holy baptism, and the Lord's Supper. Seems like almost nothing to the world around us. Those are just words written down long ago. That's just some bread and some wine. It's just a little bit of water. What good is that going to do? Well, the Holy Spirit is at work through those means. And where God's word is 
preached and proclaimed in its purity and the sacraments are administered rightly, their God is at work. And he changes hearts. He turns things around, leading us to recognize the sin that is in our lives, to realize the, the craziness of some of the thinking of our world, and to return to our Lord repentantly acknowledging our sin and calling on him for the forgiveness that only he can offer because it was won for us once and for all by Jesus Christ our Lord on that cross of Calvary. Set your minds on the things of God, his intent for each of us that we would know him as Lord and Savior that we would receive from him the forgiveness of sins in the ways that he has provided. Because he wants us to be his now and forever. That's what he had his mind set on. The things of God had to do with us men and our salvation. That we would be brought into his kingdom that we would be secure in that kingdom and that we would be his forever. Peter confesses Christ. Peter is rebuked by Christ. But Christ always had the intent that Peter was to be saved along with all the others that he had come to gather unto himself, including sinners like you and me. In Jesus' name, amen.